I'm just going to start this morning with a video. Um, am I on? Not on? Oh, a bit closer. How's that, brother? Sound all right? Testing, one, two. Um, I'm just going to play a video now um, from Carl Faison, just, just at the beginning of my message this morning, just to prepare our hearts as we enter this Easter season. So thanks, guys. Yeah. In an increasingly secular society, it's kind of surprising that Easter is still so important. We did some research on what days mattered most to Australians, and first was Anzac Day, then Remembrance Day, but it was closely followed by Christmas and Easter. This is not just a cultural hangover. This actually speaks into human longing. It's a bit like creativity, like art and music and dance. They actually speak into the human heart. Those two things came together in Australia in 1907. You see, there was a tour of Australia of a quite famous painting. If you go to St Paul's Cathedral in London, in a side chapel is a painting called The Light of the World. It was painted by Holman Hunt. This painting is a visual representation of Revelation 3.20, where Jesus is standing at the door of people's hearts. When this painting came to Australia, it was seen by literally thousands of people. It was a remarkable response. In fact, it was almost like a revival, especially in Melbourne, where people broke through barriers to get closer to the painting. There were stories of people breaking down in tears in front of the painting. Now, if you see a painting as just oil paint on canvas, this response is completely inexplicable. But if you see that painting as representing God reaching out to humanity, then it's completely understandable. You see, the human heart longs to be known by God. And Easter represents God speaking into the human heart, that Jesus would come to earth, die on a cross, and rise to life again so that we may know forgiveness and a relationship with God. You know, that's the longing of the human heart, the longing to be known, the longing to be loved, the longing to be forgiven, the longing to know that our lives actually count for something. You know, Easter is not just an event that we tell ourselves the story each year to jog our memory. Easter is a moment in time where we can know God personally. That's my prayer for you this Easter. How good is that? You know, I must admit I've been captured a lot lately by that painting and those words from Jesus in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. What an incredible invitation from the King of Kings. Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts, wanting to come in to share life in this intimate relationship. You know, there's a detail in that painting by Holman Hunt that a number of people noticed when he first painted it and thought, you've made a mistake with this painting. You didn't paint it. There's no handle on the outside of the door. And he deliberately didn't paint a handle on the outside of the door because you, the door needs to be opened from the inside. We need to let Jesus come into our lives. And uh, we're doing this series uh, called Amazing Grace. And the thing about this amazing grace is it doesn't barge into a person's life. Uh, grace is to be, be received. It needs to be let in to a person's heart. But we can think of this gift sometimes like, is grace like a parcel that a courier drops off at the door? It's exciting, isn't it, when you order. I ordered new running shoes recently and they arrive, you know, and the parcel's there, you open the door, you can thank the courier, but then you shut the door and you enjoy the gift. Well, Jesus is not a divine courier. Let's get that clear today. Jesus is the king and he's the gift. Receiving his grace means opening the door to receive him, the one who is the Lord and the Saviour. And I want to ask today, whether you're at home or you're here, have you opened the door yet to this king? Many have. He lives in you. You live in him. 
and it's changed your life. But then there are others and you would say that um, I can hear the knocking, you know. I, I can hear Jesus knocking on the door of my heart, but I haven't opened it yet. But you know maybe he's inviting you to do that for him, to open it into a relationship with him. But then there might be others today, and you would say that I've opened the door to Jesus, but that relationship doesn't seem very real or very alive, like that mealtime intimacy of sharing with Jesus. Um, there's something causing difficulty. There must be something I'm missing. Maybe there's something competing or spoiling that relationship that you really long for. On the outside, it can be hard for anyone to really know whether we've opened the door of our heart to Jesus or not. We can seem like those who have opened the door. Yet only on the inside, in a person's true heart, do we really know if the king has entered in or not. And for those considering Jesus, what you do need to know is what kind of king is he? What kind of king is Jesus? Uh, compared to what maybe we think he might be or what we would prefer Jesus to be. A lot of people have an idea about Jesus and that's what they believe. But what does the Bible teach us about this king and what he's like? Well, it's Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Easter weekend, and, I want to look, and the story of Jesus entering in Jerusalem, where we were celebrating with palm branches this morning, it's told in all four Gospels. Um, but I'm going to be in the Gospel of John today. In John chapter 12, 12 to 16, let me just read these verses. The next day, the great crowd that have, had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So it was the prophet Zechariah who wrote about, wrote about the Messiah King would come riding on a donkey. So for the crowd of Jews that day, they knew what this meant. They were celebrating, hoping Jesus was this promised king that they'd longed for. And the word Hosanna means save us. They're yelling out, save us. They were looking for a king to save them from Roman oppression and establish Israel as the greatest nation in the world, God's nation and God's people. But less than a week later, after this exciting moment and celebration, the same crowd, many from that same crowd, would be shouting in different words, crucify him, crucify him. And that is because Jesus didn't come as a military king that they wanted. And most would reject him for that. Many people, see, make up their mind of the kind of king they want Jesus to be. But he might not be that kind of king at all. And uh, therefore they either reject him when they discover this or they accept a flawed understanding about Jesus based on preference rather than truth. Before and after Jesus' entry into Jerusalem are, are these two stories of entering into people's lives, in, in, uh, where Jesus enters into people's homes and shares a meal. And in these stories, we discover the kind of king Jesus is and the kind of person who opens their heart to him. I found it interesting, the first time I've ever noticed that around this entry into Jerusalem is this, this entry into these homes in John on both sides of this. And if, the first is at the home of Lazarus. And let me read some of these verses from verse 1 of chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a, about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the right fragrance of the perfume. 
But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. The dinner was in Jesus' honour at Lazarus' house. And I suppose if you get raised from the dead, a dinner party to say thank you would probably be the least you would do, you know. If somebody's raising you from the dead, you're not giving them a, a McHappy Meal voucher. You're throwing a pretty good dinner and probably more than that. So Lazarus has got this dinner in Jesus' honour, what he has done. For him. And so no, for, there was no doubt around that table that Lazarus and his sisters Martha and Mary about the kind of king they believed Jesus to be. They loved him and, and, and Mary expressed this in an extravagant way. You know, she heard, poured poor perfume on his feet, perfume worth a year's wages, just poured out in that moment. I, I often think, did she consider the cost of this um, or weigh up what life would be like without that financial security we don't know but it kind of seems like this spontaneous act of worship and love for Jesus and yet Jesus knowing he would soon die for the sins of the world also knew this perfume would have been poured out at his burial but Mary had chosen this moment to worship him. And her, her extravagant worship is contrasted with Judas, who despises her actions. Uh, he thought he knew the kind of king Jesus was. I mean, for three years he'd seen Jesus care for the poor, love the weak and the vulnerable, reach out to rescue those who are oppressed. And an appeal to wasting this money instead of using it for the poor should have got Jesus' approval, Jesus, uh, Judas thought. But he was so wrong. He didn't know Jesus at all. His heart was not open, rather it was full of greed. He really wanted the money for himself. And Judas is like those who judge the motives of others' worship from behind the limits of their religion. He witnessed extravagance he would never be prepared to offer. Someone moving beyond the boundaries he was comfortable with and it threatened him. And out of that comes criticism, discredit. So he tried to discredit Mary. Look, Jesus, bad motives. Look at the waste. She doesn't know what you're like, but I do. So this dinner to honour Jesus exposed the hearts of those around the table. For Judas, he loved an idol of the heart as a greater king than Jesus. And that was lived out in his life, an idol that would lead him to betray Jesus for just 30 pieces of silver within a week. He would have been a negative presence at the, around that table. But for Mary, Jesus was her king and her saviour. Disregarding the cost, she took her final opportunity before his death to express her love and devotion. The beautiful fragrance filled the room creating an environment of worship and honour to this wonderful king. You know, what kind of king is Jesus to you as we enter the Easter week? We can see Jesus through our, our religious limits and try and make him fit into that scene or, or we can receive Jesus as our king and our saviour and hold nothing back in worshipping him. It's actually at a second meal that the kind of King Jesus is, is revealed in John. And it's here we learn how we can respond and fully open the door of our hearts, no matter what place we are in this morning, to be captured by his love, to be changed by his love, and to respond with love for him. And this story is found in John chapter 13. And what Jesus does before this meal, would, you would not expect from any king in this world. 
Verse 1 in chapter 13, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. He came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, do you not realise now what I'm doing? But later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean and not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him and that was why he had not said everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Jesus shows us, um, as the, the old NIV version says, the full extent of his love. You know, washing feet uh, was a job of only the lowliest servants that they would do. It was actually known as like an extreme act of hospitality. But there were no servants in this room, in this upper room, where the disciples were there for this meal. And they weren't exactly running for the towel and the basin to wash each other's feet. They were reclined at the table, with dirty feet and Jesus gets up and takes off his outer garment and puts on a towel and he takes on the appearance of a lowly slave. This is the king. Jesus then begins one by one washing the disciples' feet. The scene appears enormously inappropriate. I mean, even more than Mary's extravagant pouring out of the perfume. The great and powerful and holy God washing the feet of this bunch of ordinary blokes. And not only that, as he went around the circle, he would have come to Judas. Jesus even washed the feet of someone about to sell him out. You know, if you've been looking for a definition of love and you've wondered what does it look like in its purity and greatness... Well, here it is. It's really seen in how far someone would go, how low they would stoop to serve another. The greater that distance, the greater the love. And and we learn in Philippians 2 that Jesus is God and he says he, he did not consider equality with God. You don't get higher than that as something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of of a servant, the kind of servant that washes people's feet. You don't get a greater distance and that's why you don't get a greater love. The hands that that, that flung the stars into space washing the dirt of the feet of sinful people. What kind of king is this? Not who most expect, yet it's the king we actually need to open the door to which actually always requires us to be confronted with him serving and washing us. You know, imagine if you were in that room, if you could take yourself to that moment. You too had witnessed three years of Jesus in action. Um, His authority to calm a storm over evil and sickness and death. And you were beginning to grasp who this was the majesty of this king. 
and then the bowl comes to you and he kneels at your feet and looks up at your eyes. How do you respond? You know, maybe like Peter, verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. You know, Peter can see how outrageous this is, how this looks, the difference between you and me, Lord. This is all around the wrong way. We need to swap places immediately. I can think we can understand Peter's response. I mean, it was John the Baptist who kind of had a similar um, awakening. You know, the one whose who's sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. And Jesus asked him to baptize him. You know, you wash my feet? No way. But then Jesus turns it around. He says, unless I wash you... You have no part of me. It's an important part of the gospel right here. So here's the, the predicament that every one's in. We feel so unworthy. And we are. We are aware of the deepest sins and the darkest moments. And so is Jesus. And we feel shame as he comes near because he's holy and perfect and we're not. Sometimes our pain, our shame speaks and we push Jesus away. We retreat to another room, that familiar place where we can sit behind a shut door and tell God that he doesn't love us. But you need to hear this again from Jesus. Unless I wash you, unless you receive my love, then you have no part in me. There isn't another way. You know, many try other ways as if there's something we can do for God that makes up for it all. But it's useless, isn't it? There's only one way to share in Christ. Jesus washes us first. We love because he first loved us. It doesn't work the other way. He loves us after we love him first. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you're a parent here today, you know about cleaning up your kids. I remember one of our kids once in one of their cute little jumpsuits standing up in their cot and walking into the room and the room smelled like death itself. And something was poking up at the back of their jumpsuit. What was it? Their nappy didn't hold the explosion. How can that much come out of one child? And you know underneath that jump site, there are all kinds of awful. What do you do as a parent? Too much? No, you call your wife and you tell them the... No. You, you deal with it. You want to clean them up, don't you? Like you, just, you know you've got to peel back that and it's going to be a pretty wild scene, but you want to clean them because you love them. You don't want them to stay like that. I can't get you back onto this message now, so let me try and use a different metaphor. Jesus just loves us so much. It doesn't matter how dirty we feel. He just wants to clean us, and unless he can, we can't have any part of him. Think about two buildings that, need, that open the doors, a tomb and a hospital. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen those really beautiful tombs that people buy, you know, you've got to be really wealthy and sometimes they're made out of marble or they're painted white and they're just incredible gardens around them and uh, they're peaceful places, not much noise, but you know you don't want to walk in that door <laughs> because inside, they look great on the outside, but inside there's only death. But think about an emergency room. You mightn't look too ornate on the outside. Open the door in there and you do see all kinds of awful. You see blood and you see broken bodies and wounds and sickness and vomit and you hear noise. And... But it's a place of healing though, isn't it? Medical staff are doing their very best to save lives to clean people up, to put people back together. Two very different environments there. 
You know, we, we can shut Jesus out and clean up the outside. That's what the Pharisees did. And Jesus actually said, you're, all, you're like a whitewashed tomb. It's death on the inside only. And we keep Jesus out because we don't want him to come into that place. But we want to be more like that emergency room and know that Jesus is more like those medical staff. He just wants to come in to the mess, to the brokenness, to the wounds, to the sin. And he wants to cleanse us and he wants to heal us and he wants to put us back together because he loves us so much. I think it's worth opening the door. We want to be a church like that, don't we? To not be a building (laughs) that doesn't have life inside it. (laughs) but to be like a hospital where all kinds of people, where all kinds of mess can come and meet this king who washes feet. Well, this is what he wanted to do for Peter at the beginning of the church, and he wants to do for you and for me. And Peter didn't understand it at first. Jesus said he would later. Well, we are living in the later. We know what Jesus was doing was pointing to an event that was about to happen. And so Judas, with clean feet but an unclean and closed heart, would run out of that room and sell Jesus out. And then Jesus would be arrested. He would stand in a corrupt trial. He would be beaten and flogged and nailed to a cross. And his love is so great that he was even obedient to the worst kind of death. So much. Did he want us to be saved into a relationship with him? So much did he want to enter into our lives. So Jesus was not just washing feet, he was going to wash away shame and sin with his blood. You know, pride can keep us from opening that door, but if we humble ourselves, that's where we meet the king who is humble, kneeling to wash us. You know, you might even be listening today or here today and there's something you've been carrying for years and you just keep it locked away and it's caused so much shame and you just carry on and you can't let anyone into that place. Jesus wants you to come to him. Psalm 51 says, A humble and contrite heart he will not despise. There is nothing more attractive to God than an open and humble heart. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to Easter Sunday when we celebrate life bursting out of the tomb because that's what Jesus did. He can turn a tomb into a maternity ward in our lives. Michaela's getting baptised, praise God. She's beaming already. Michaela finished Alpha in first term and I was so thrilled to see a light bulb moment as Michaela said, I want to follow Jesus. I want him to be the centre of my life. I want to be baptised. Michaela's the daughter of Mel and Chris who were our first baptisms one year ago on Easter Sunday. How great is that church? This is the kind of God we follow, isn't it? This is the kind of God that changes lives. And what joy when you see someone open the door and Jesus comes in and he pours out his amazing grace into their hearts. It's all of Jesus for all of us. But Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me, then Then Simon replied, not just my feet then, Lord, wash my hands and my head as well. The lights come on. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash their feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew he was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. So unusual Peter style, he went to the extreme. I love Peter because I tend to go to the extreme as well. From wanting to wash his feet washed to wanting himself fully washed. And Jesus must have smiled, you know. And then he explains something really, really important about the gospel and having a relationship with God. If you're a follower of Jesus, have opened the door, received him as your king and saviour, then you 
have been made clean. You have been saved. You've been brought into that relationship with God. That is a one-off event that does not need to be repeated. That was a genuine decision. You can trust in that. But our feet get dirty walking in this world. So Jesus said, I I need to wash your feet again. Not all of you, just your feet. Because you need to be right with me. Stay in close relationship to really take part in my plans and the transformation I want to do in your life. There was one who was among the disciples whose heart was not surrendered to the Lord and who would choose 30 pieces of silver over having Jesus' life. But that decision wasn't a decision in the moment. It had had been made many, many times in, in his life, whenever there was an opportunity to respond. But let's respond differently. Like, Peter, I I want all of you, Lord. I'm ready ready to accept your love and be washed clean, to deal with the past, to love you as you love me. You know, this Easter is a moment to open our hearts to God afresh and to receive this amazing grace of God, King Jesus and all he has done for us to be put right with God, to live in right relationship with him and to spend many times having our feet washed even though we don't have to have a full bath again. You know, what a moment to have your feet washed by the king and that's how much he loves you and that's what he offers us, the kind of king Jesus is. Well, to finish with, while the disciples' feet were still wet, the effects from the effects of being washed. And while they were no doubt overwhelmed by God's love, Jesus said in verse 12, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so for that is what I am. Now I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus has shown us his love, church. And now he says, follow my example. You've seen how in the midst of brokenness and sin, how this love has brought you freedom and dignity. So you can expect the same results when you serve others like this. When you bend down to make others great, they will experience me being loved through you. Jesus said, no servant is greater than their master. You know, if you think about your greatest hero, your greatest inspiration in this world, someone whose work and service has inspired you, imagine them coming to you and say, I want you to carry on my work. What an honour that would be. What an honour this is. As Jesus says these words, if we follow his example, he promises we're going to be blessed by that. We will know that incredible satisfaction of being used by God. We will sense and experience him working through us. But who do we love? Well, just look around the room first. This is the place to start. To love one another, even in this place. To have an opportunity to serve those around you. I mean, love is a core, one of the core values of this church. And it's the greatest. As Paul said, he said, if you could crunch everything down to three words, to be themes of our life, faith, hope, and love would be those three words. But the greatest of these, he said, is love. So Jesus gave us this example and command. He washed our feet and he tells us to do the same. He isn't saying to be a doormat, but to hold the towel. And imagine if everyone followed Jesus' example. People with great power use that power for service. We wouldn't be reading about horrific wars like we are today in this world. We can't pick up a towel for others, but we can pick one up ourselves. We're only responsible for how we respond to God in this. There are people everywhere who don't consider for a moment that Jesus is king. 
a king like we've described. And how does that view changed? It's by someone who's been washed clean to stoop down and wash their feet one person at a time. Judas would just reject this message. He saw himself as greater than the master because he wouldn't go as low as the master would go. But this is the call on the disciples to serve our great king and to love him in this way. So this morning, let's respond as we begin the Easter week. Open the door and let Jesus come in in humility to allow him to to wash us clean. Maybe it's a bath. To receive him as king for the very first time. You know, you might have had one idea about the kind of king Jesus was, but as we've looked at this kind of king today, to open your heart and to say, Jesus, I want you to come in. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to just confront everything that you want to cleanse in my life. Invite him in as your Lord and Saviour. But if you have a relationship with Jesus today, it's to make, it's to wash our feet and to cleanse us afresh at the beginning of this Easter week so we can take part in him and all he wants to do in and through our lives. And the other response is to serve. Someone might come to mind immediately that you can go out and serve in a practical way. Jesus has already put it on your heart. There's a way you can serve, even this very week. Show them the love of Jesus. But also, as we think as a church, in term two, the opportunities to serve and love the body of Christ here, to serve our community and our world. That's a practical example of following Jesus' example. Whether it's to serve children or young people or adults or families serving in love humility offering grace being an example of Jesus in life for others to see to use our words and actions to offer time and resources to not earn anything but to love as we have been loved let's pray together Lord Jesus, what a what a king you are. We look at the leaders of this world and kings of history, Lord, and we can't find any anyone even close to you. They would have the kind of power and majesty and resources you have, but would stoop that low because of such great love to lift us up and to change our lives. And Jesus, I really believe that if you wanted to change the view of some even this very morning, whether watching online or here today, Lord, that they could know that this is the kind of king you are and this is, you want to come in to their lives. You're knocking on their door and you come first with a towel long to cleanse them, change them and put them back together. If that's you this morning, you simply need to in this moment say, King Jesus, I just want to say thank you for who you are. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin so that I could be forgiven and washed clean. Please come and be my Lord and Saviour. I accept you into my life to follow you from this day forward. You prayed that prayer. You are a new creation. Your life is is never going to be the same. For others here today, maybe your feet are dirty here today. You've got a relationship with God and Yet there's something that you just know that you want Jesus to seek his forgiveness for today. Whether it's sat there for a while or whether it's just this week. He loves you. He looks at you. He's, he's 
ready to cleanse you afresh. And it's probably all of us. And so, Lord, we just open our hearts. And maybe you just want to open your hands this morning as we pray. And just hold them out. You can trust in this God who loves to come and forgive. And just say, oh, Jesus, I love you, Lord. Recognize you as holy and good, merciful and kind. And Jesus, that, that thing that's on my heart this morning, I give to you. I'm repenting in your presence this morning and praying that you would come and forgive me, Lord. Wash me clean, fill me afresh with your spirit. Oh, Lord Jesus, I want to do life closely with you. Lead me this week right through Easter to learn from you, to love you, to worship you, to follow your calling to love others in this world. So we pray these things in Jesus' name.